When talking about solubility in the past, we spent a lot of time talking about the structure of the molecules and formula units involved. For example, we talked about how polar solutes will dissolve in polar solvents, and nonpolar solutes will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. And we talked about how some ionic compounds will dissolve in a polar solute while others will not. We looked into coulombic forces and those with very high charges, both on their cation and anion, are less likely to dissolve, where things with very low charges, plus one and minus one charges, are more likely to dissolve. I want to spend time in this video and the next couple of videos looking at other factors beyond simply polarity that can affect the solubility. And I'd like to start with temperature. Generally speaking, as you increase the temperature of the solvent, you can dissolve more solid into it. There are some exceptions. You can see that here the sodium sulfate will become less soluble as you increase the temperature, and the same here with the cerium sulfate down here. But for the most part, as you increase the temperature of the solvent, your solid will become more soluble. Any of you that have made rock candy before know that in warm water, you can dissolve a ridiculous amount of sugar. So for example, this curve ends at just over 60 degrees, maybe 65 degrees, and it's saying that you can dissolve 300 grams of sugar in 100 grams of water, which leads to a little bit more vocab here. We can talk about when a solution is saturated, and we can talk about when a solution is unsaturated. So if I go back at, and look at this curve, these curves are showing saturation points, when a solvent is holding as much solute as possible. So if we look at sugar here, at 20 degrees Celsius, you can put approximately 200 grams of sugar in 100 grams of water. That's where it gets saturated. If you don't put as much sugar, say you only put 100 grams of sugar in, well then there's more room for sugar to dissolve. And so you can add more and more sugar until you get to the saturation point. But if you try to add more sugar, then you'll go beyond the saturation point. For those of you that like to put sugar in your cereal, you'll know this. Because if you put too much sugar in your cereal, at the bottom of your bowl is undissolved sugar. Because you saturated the milk in your cereal with sugar. And you put in more than it could dissolve. And so you have these sugar crystals in the bottom of your bowl. The same thing happens to your friends who drink coffee but don't like coffee. They put so much sugar in their coffee that when they get to the bottom of the cup, they just have a mound of sugar that's undissolved in the bottom of their cup. It is possible to supersaturate a solution. This is a similar phenomenon to superheating or supercooling a liquid. If you warm up a solvent and carefully add more and more solute, you can actually, and I'm going to kind of put vocal quotes around this, but you can actually kind of trick the solvent into holding more solute than you would otherwise expect looking at a solubility curve like this. The problem is that these solutions that are super saturated are super unstable. All they need is a little bit of a shake or like a seed crystal that serve as a nucleation site. And then the super saturated solute will simply recrystallize very rapidly until you get back down to the regular saturation point. I want to finish off this look at temperature as a means of affecting solubility by discussing gases. In the previous curve, you saw that as you increase the temperature, you generally increase the solubility of a solid. The opposite is true for a gas. As you increase the temperature, you actually decrease the solubility of a gas. The gas particles will move more and more and more at higher temperatures, and they're more likely to leave the solution than they are in cold solvents. This is why a warm can of soda will fizz more than a cold can of soda, because carbon dioxide is more soluble in cold water than it is in warm water. This is also why large whales will migrate. They travel to the north and south polar regions in order to feed because the water is so cold that it contains enough oxygen to support huge populations of krill and plankton. However, giving birth to young calves in cold water is dangerous. So the whales will migrate to warmer waters to give birth, and then once those young whales are large enough to migrate back, they'll go back to the colder climes to get the food that they require. 